You're listening to STP Radio. Hello, software test professionals. This is Mark Tomlinson, your loyal host of STP Radio. And I'm very excited because today I have a guest, Mr. Richard Bradshaw. You might know him as the Friendly Tester or Friendly Tester on Twitter. Um, he is a uh, he's a citizen of the United Kingdom, living on a quiet street in Beeston, Nottingham. Richard, how are you? Welcome to STP Radio. I'm very, I'm very good. Cheers for having me, Mark. How oh, are you? Yeah. yeah, I'm really, really good. Now, you and I uh, didn't get a chance to actually talk enough at the recent test bash down in Brighton. But I understand that, you know, from someone like yourself who lives, you know, in Nottingham or originally from Manchester, being in Brighton is could be a little bit scary. Uh, it's it's to the south, maybe. It's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, right? it's a little south and I tend to travel. Um, I'm quite, quite forward in my uh, dislike of London because it's really busy. But I think once you've gone through London, uh, Brighton's actually nice. But it is a, it's a long journey for us. It, 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 okay, so it's the journey. Brighton itself is is just delightful. I found, and we had actually nice weather for March. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, we did. It was really good weather. Uh, I was going to say Brighton. Brighton is a really really nice place. It's just like on driving there would be a nightmare, and it takes a good over three and a half hours on the train from Nottingham. So it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Test bus is awesome. And if I'm not sure where Test Bash will be uh, next year, but uh, we'll see. I, I'm right. going. I will sign. It is, is it going to be in Brighton? It's always in Brighton. Yep. So very good. And so uh, one of the things that you recently had given a talk at Less Test just a few weeks ago um, was on the topic of sort of automation is just a tool. And I thought that was a great place to start the conversation because we have a lot of folks in at least the SDP community and the Greater Tester community at large that are always have an appetite for talking about automation and where it fits so maybe you could recap kind of the lightning pitch you gave just a little bit yeah so the the, the theme of the talk was that um you know as an industry when when you mention the word automation to um testers uh, or just people in software development from a testing uh, in a testing context they immediately um tend to think of like end-to-end tests or checks like a full a full piece of automation that runs a check and posts the results somewhere Whereas yeah. for me, I, I believe automation is simply we're automating a, a task or process that we would want to do ourselves anyway, um, but we want to speed the process up. So essentially, it just becomes a tool. It's like any other tool that you might download off the web, like you want a proxy. Doing that yourself manually is too much, so you get a tool. Um, yes. So I think that that's obviously an extreme tool. You have to be quite smart to do that. But uh, essentially, we're providing something that, um, we're creating something that we're going to use um, to make our job to make that that specific task easier. Um, so based on that, I think we're missing a trick as testers to not view automation as a tool because then there's so much more that we can do with automation to assist our testing. Um, that technically is automation because we'll be automating part of the process we want to do, and we're just not automating the whole journey. Yeah. If you really look at it just a tool, you might forget the meaning that is uh, imbued upon that as this is part of my testing. This is not really separate from it sort of sticks as one in your thinking like a screwdriver would for an electrician doing, you know, dr- you doing screw driving or something. Yeah, I think a lot of us, we tend to view it as, you know, um, if we automate that, we don't have to think about it anymore. Like, you know, that's part of our testing is now done. Um, whereas we really... You know, we're not like if, you know, I, I'm I'm fond of calling it checking. So I would say that, that the checking is very important and it suits itself to automation. But in the whole picture, we're actually doing testing and we're using automation to assist us with our checking. Um, so in that sense, it is just serving purpose as a tool. But it can't, it can't, doesn't, it doesn't exist on its own. It has to be triggered by somebody, and its results have to be reviewed. Yeah. Especially if, as we start increasing the frequency of use in unattended continuous integration, that regression suite gets run more and more and more and more frequently. Um, I also think there's a meta learning that happens with regression, where if you have the net of checkpoints across an entire regression suite, there are things that may change within the code base that reveal bugs that were there all the time, and suddenly the, the right alignment released something. 
And, um, and so if you're just running it and sort of check it, uh, set it and forget it as automation, there's actually all sorts of new bugs that can come out of regression that may not always go back to something that you would do manually um, or think as, you know, hey, I'm going to pull out this automated script and run that. I agree. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, the, the automation as a tool in that context is fantastic. You know, you, you should run it. You've invested heavily in it. You sh- it should run 24-7. Yeah. Um, no reason why you shouldn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, it's not. Uh, it doesn't cost you. You know, your machines are probably running anyway. So it doesn't cost you any money. And yes, it likely might find. It potentially probably will find more bugs if you're continuously running it. Yeah, there could be other weird anomalies. You, there could be some very weird um, production-like bug that makes it in there. Uh, definitely, but also it's not just focusing on the actual system under test. You might find bugs with your framework. Um, certain times of the day, the framework might stop working for whatever reason, or mm-hmm. if there's a if your CI is running several tests on the same machine at the same time, you know mm-hmm. there might be some cross cross automation bleed that you're going to have to address. Yeah, it it brings up a good question about automation frameworks and people sort of taking the raw test tool and building more elaborate or um, maybe reusable code or making it easier to implement automation. I'm just curious. In your experience, you know, what's the, what's the good and the bad of that? Then uh, I have my own experience, but I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on, on really going after frameworks. Um, I think um, for me, I, I personally believe that, you know, we need to design our own frameworks. Um, we need the tools off the shelf. Um, you know, they will serve a purpose. But as soon as you start relying on automation more, I think you need to have more control of it. And I think you can only get that if you uh, code it yourself. Um, so I'm very much of people um, going down the route of designing a really good architecture for their automation, for, for specific test automation or check, or, or check mm-hmm. um, where we, you know, you, you need to build an architecture that, that allows you to do all the things you want to do, such as create data in your database, call APIs, navig- you know, control a website. Um, and then you build several frameworks on top of that for whatever purpose you want to be. So one of those might be checking. Um, so you'll build a certain framework just for your checking. But if you write the code in such a way, you've then got a code base to create several more frameworks on top of that for whatever reasons you might want to do. That's interesting. So it's it's actually a sort of a layered approach in terms of frameworks borrowing on top of one another. So you, you're not constantly having to rewrite. You think about app development building on top of frameworks. That's what we're doing with, say, Java in Spring, or we're doing in .NET with just layers and layers of frameworks. Um, I, I'm a performance guy, so that always scares me that the framework itself gets so slow it doesn't execute any tests. Um, so you have, probably have to watch out for that. Right. <laughs> um, but there's, I think, what do you think about the idea um, in terms of organizing a team that, you know, some people, a lot of people ask the question like, hey, you, if I have a mix of automated testers versus developers versus people do manual exploratory testing, how do I manage a team like that? And I know you've worked at several different companies in, in certain roles and even leadership roles where maybe you're helping organize and, and give advice on how to organize. What are your thoughts on, on that automation versus manual testing kind of thing? Um, I think, you know, um, I think... Back to the the whole, you know, checking is an integral part of any approach to, uh, you know, uh, to testing, especially when you've got a tool that's going to, uh, a product that's going to evolve over time. Yeah. Um, and automation fits perfectly with checking. Um, but I think it's, you, you need to have the skills within the team, but I don't think it should stay as one person doing it all the time. And by team as well, I don't just mean testers, I mean the developers as well. Mm-hmm. Um some automation, you know, when we, when we were talking about architectures before and frameworks, a lot of the time, once they're built, it's like becomes a maintenance process. Um, so, you know, someone, someone with the skill set needs to maintain it, but also it should be relatively easy enough for anyone in the team to write some automation. Um, because we're not talking about complicated test scenarios, but, you know, we're talking about simple checks. Um, so I think anyone can learn how to do that. Um, so in that sense, then we have, um, you know, multiple people can do it. And then, uh, so, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd be really uncomfortable in a team if I was just the guy who wrote automation all the time. Um, sure. It's not exciting. Um, you know, once you've built the framework, that's probably the exciting bit. After that, maintenance isn't great. Um, but also you, you, your thought process as a tester will get, will get stagnant. 
you, you know, you, you'll lose your creative edge because you're just doing, essentially you're doing test cases all day long. You're just automating them. Um, and there's very little, you know, there's very little thought process in that. Um, so I would rather have a team. It, my, in my past, I've had people who can do everything. Yeah. So we, I know that's not always possible, but if you build a framework that sets, say, currently people's frame, favorite is building uh, BDD tools into their automation, uh, any tester then can write an automated check because they just need to know the steps that are available, string them together, and they'll, they'll create a test. So they don't need to know about the back end in that instance. So then your team can get up to speed and write automation, um, but also mix them around. So they are doing some manual testing. They are doing exploratory testing. And they might realize themselves that, you know, there's something in the automation that they could utilize to help them with those other, those other approaches to testing. Yeah, you, I, you may be familiar with a guy by the name of Ben Samo. Uh, and Ben's yeah. the qual- quality frog. And I remember talking with him once about uh, building a tool to do exploratory performance testing. And it would be a form of automation, but it would be, uh, I want to say it's very uh, tactile. It, it's the wrong word because if we're in the software virtual. It'd be like virtually tactile where you could sort of grab an API virtually um, yeah. or metaphorically and say, all right, I'm going to, hammer this thing with a hundred thousand hits per second while I do something else. It's like, it makes sense if I think about like Stephen King's the lawnmower man where you're in a total virtual reality. Um, but I, I don't think that the testing tools are quite able to give you a full consciousness within a virtual reality to test your APIs. I think it are probably a uh, ways off from that. Yeah, I think so. I had a conversation with, um, uh, Doug Hoffman at Belgian testing days. Yeah. And where he's a big fan of, um, exploratory automation, um, but I've I've never hundred percent got to grips with it. Like I, I understand, you know, we could have a system. They, so they use the example of Google Maps. Mm-hmm. So they would do Google would randomly pick a city, two cities, and do the search, and then look at the results, say from Manchester to Philadelphia, um, and then it would do Philadelphia to Manchester. Yep, and then it would compare like the distance and the times and various like key destinations along the way. And then it would just sit there doing that all day long. Um, so in a sense, it is exploratory, but it's only ever got a few oracles. Um, and it's never going to learn from what it's doing. Yeah. So that's the bit I get concerned with. Um, yeah, because how does it, if you don't have a, a, a sentient being of some sort, um, um, a, a sapient being that's actually guiding and growing and relating, that from an oracle perspective, relating is what derives meaning from what you observe. And so um, those differences are how those things relate. How would you, you, you would have to have a human being interacting to some extent, unless we talked about, um, you know, automation in a framework, actually having some kind of artificial intelligence. You remember web 3.0, like this is probably six years ago, the web 3.0 it was supposed to have artificial intelligence as part of the next generation of the web. And um, I, I don't know, but, Maybe we're creating Skynet in um, in artificial intelligence in your in your framework. You have have you ever built anything like that? No, I um, I think that the the only thing I I did that was tempted to explore recently was after, that was actually after Belgian testing days was trying to. I think um, a lot of us we should probably try and code more oracles into our automation. So a lot of us just have one fixed assertion at the end of a test, say. Yeah. If that assertion fails, then uh, you know the test falls over while well, it fails. Um, but I think we should also perhaps then carry on and do it collect collect a few more inf- a bit more information as well. Um, so perhaps we could start coding you know several layers of oracles into our assertions. Oh, definitely, uh, definitely. That might actually introduce some. You know, it will certainly get us more information. Um, and also might reveal more bugs that are normally hidden by the first one. Yeah, exactly. So this brings me to another question. The more and more we give the framework either uh, a little bit more capability to draw decisions from either multiple oracles and apply them, I think there's also maybe some fear. I don't want to. I don't know if it's quite fear, just apprehension about um, people in the measurement world, in the metrics world, that say, you know. How's my, how do I measure my manual testing and have visibility into the value of my manual testers? 
um, versus how do I have visibility into the value of automation? So how, how do you make automation, the value of it, visible? Um, is it just quantitative metrics or are there other ways that you want to basically see that, that that regression suite and all the different frameworks you build are actually valuable? Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of saying that, you know, like um, automation needs to have like an ROI or a lot of metrics associated to it. Okay. Um, I've had, you know, my um, bit of a plug, my upcoming cast talk is very much on this topic. Um, and the, the issue there, I think, is that automation is there to serve the team. It's, you know, like we said before, checking is important and we need to do it. And automation is perfect for it. But what it does is it frees the testers up to do other things that can help the testing team. A lot of people say, oh, if I've got loads of automation, then I can do loads of exploratory testing. And yeah. it's true, you could. But there's also lots of other things you need to do. You need to build relationships with the developers and the product owners. You need to look at the new stories that might be coming through. Uh, you might know, need to do some coaching and mentoring within your team. Um, there's lots of things you need to do. So I think automation gives it gives the, t- the, ta- the team more time to do other things. And like that's incredibly hard to measure. But you would hopefully see, you know, that your team is um, finding a lot more interesting bugs. They're collecting a lot more information that's useful for the business. Um, and they probably are. I, I would hope they would be a lot happier as well um, because, you know, they're having fun being creative and being testers. Yeah. I, I remember speaking um, with, I think it was uh, Griffin Jones about sort of a session based uh, time management for testing and actually understanding that most companies, if you're in employment of some sort as a tester, they obviously everyone tracks their time, you know, hours yeah. spent doing things. So it's actually a brilliant way to make sure we categorize the value differently depending on what type of testing or what type of activity, like you say, be it mentoring or building relationships or communicating uh, the meaning of a test, designing new tests going and investigating production, you know, how I've, you know, maybe there's some new stuff or old stuff that's like, well, I tested it, but I've never seen talk to anyone in the real world that actually used that. And it can be incredibly valuable. Um, and the only way to really see it, if you basically gave a diverse categorization, maybe a, I see a pie chart with different colors because managers love the colors. If you said what percentage of your time is spent uh, you know, in different types of valuable, uh, here's all the different things we value and we are spread pretty evenly instead of we spend 90% of our time just heads down trapped in a room automating tests. <laughs> yeah, I agree as well. I think, um, and uh, I've been very lucky in the, the teams that I've had where I've not really had this, um, this, that level of management who's not really close to me, if you know what I mean, who's sure, who's not really like, you know, knows what it is we're doing. And I think that's another thing that, testers could do with that time you know educate the rest of the company on what it is you do because a lot of people do have the opinion that you know testing can be automated so you know we need to sell them the skills that we have to offer um, and show them you know what 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 testers are capable of Mm -hmm. Um, and i think we can get that um, by being closer to management but also doing the things you said like you know report our metrics in different ways you know testers aren't about finding bugs you know, we, we, we collect information and we need to give that in, we need to share that information and tell the story of that information to people who matter. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, the managers aren't involved in that, but they should be um, because they will have a, a better appreciation of what it is we're doing. Yeah. Speaking of um, speaking of managers, because we love we love them <laughs> and they support us. Um, yeah. I, you know, I find to some extent, you know, there's influences on management, especially around testing and different reporting structures. When it comes to automation, sometimes, again, people get the idea that this is about just cutting headcount in manual testing. We're going to automate you guys out of a job. That's been a classic fear in all kinds of automation, even development or operations, uh, any kind of automation, um, you know, in other industries. How how do you make um, sense of uh, how do, how would you help a manager understand the difference between um, you know automating with tool X versus like you described at the in your lightning talk sort of there are lots of different tools and the the perception of what a tool or a vendor can do for you is different. I think I get the first bit. So the you know the that is one of the old stories that you know we can get rid of we can get rid of two testers by bringing in automation, um, but it's actually nonsense because the 
the automation, you know, yeah. like I said earlier, it, it's a tool. It needs to be, um, it needs to be triggered by someone. The results need to be checked by someone. It needs to be maintained by somebody. Um, it, it, it's not an approach to testing. Like it is just a tool. It's doing a job for the, the testing team. Um, and so I think the the key that I've had recently, if I've I've used the checking versus testing um, definitions by James and Michael. Uh, to actually educate other members of the team, and by quite yeah. quite simply just saying, look, a check isn't isn't intellectual. It doesn't take a lot of thought to create. And um, you're giving me these, you know, user stories or requirements, um, and we're simply seeing if it does what it was intended to do. You know, it's not. Um, and by that, I mean the simple thing as you know, if it was, you can sign up. Then you know, the automation could sign up, and it, there's an account in there. Um, but the issue there is. Again, that's very simplistic, and you need testers to be able to then test if that account was actually created correctly. Does it? Can you log in with it? Does it have the right details in it? Um, right. Can you use other parts of the system with that login? Uh, if you focus solely on um, checking, you, you're always focused on just a small little area. Because again, like you said earlier, your automation can't think. Um, so I call I, I use the word dumb. Automation is dumb. It should be dumb. Um, it's got no reasons. It's got no reasons to be intelligent because your <laughs> testers are there to do the intelligent work. Yeah, it's it's as it's as smart as the uh, as the critical thinking that you put into it as a tester or a designer. Yeah. Um, we, exactly. My last question, and this kind of rises out of some of the other topics we're seeing that are coming into STP's uh, proposal chain right now, is the idea of you know testing and DevOps. And I don't know if you've worked in shops that would call themselves DevOps or pseudo DevOps? Yeah, uh, I worked at um, a place recently yeah, for six months that had a DevOps team. Yeah. So do you, do you and in what way do you see automation being the, 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 the wedge that keeps the door open for testers to partake in DevOps? Um, <clears throat> well, at this current role, the automation was run um, every time they released to a production machine. Okay. The difficult bit there is people, again, relying on your automation after you've done a production release. Um, so I think there needs to be some testing taking place after that. Um, it doesn't have to be by a tester, but a tester is probably the best person to come up with the scenarios that we might want to check after we've done a produ release to production. Um, so they can definitely um, educate the DevOps engineers on what they should be looking for after they've done a production. After they've done a release to production, sorry. I think to some, if you're a purely manual testing shop, and DevOps has a DevOps engineer generally or tech ops, they they get into doing lots of automation of all those processes, and sometimes there's if you're not connected like a machine like the Borg into into the uh, into the DevOps automation, it's hard to put a manual human being's brain into that automation. So sometimes it it forces your hand to automate your testing more as the way to maintain your position and say, oh, well, I, at least I'm the test designer that's going into this automation to help DevOps pre and post release. I think that could be really influential. The other part I thought that might be interesting is a lot of times we're, we're thinking only proactively in the design of our tests. And I met with Seth Elliott, uh, chatted with him recently from Microsoft, and he has a data-driven quality sort of learning from production with data sciences on how we can actually leverage information, error information and, and such back into making stronger, better tests and actually informing manual testers. So I thought there might be something interesting to make the automation framework uh, adaptable to what it can learn from certain behaviors in production. So there's a few things I'll pick up on there, actually. The Another thing about DevOps you just mentioned is when this, this current com that company, we had a lot of monitoring um, and the monitoring was great from a tester's point of view um, because we were able to, you know, we had things like how many active users there was, what was our throughput for that day, um, which machines, you know, their CPU usages and all these, you know, real-time stats were all up on the board. Yeah. Um, no way near anything as uh, I've seen Noah Sussman say they had at Etsy. But, you know, we had some graphs and they were visual. Yeah. Uh, and the other bit there is, I've done this once at a place, is where we adapted our automation framework um, to actually 
not going to say do performance testing, talking to you, but to uh, do some <laughs> basic performance testing for us. So what it did is we had like a threshold um, and it will check the previous automation run. Um, and for such things, some of the re web driver requests, we would see how long they took. Um, and then we'd have a factor of like 10% if whether we would want to fail that test yeah. if it took longer than last time. Well, that could actually be a perfect place to use the real-time stats you're talking about. You so could, cor could yeah. You wouldn't. You wouldn't necessarily just correlate to say the previous run, but you could correlate to what's the last twenty-four hours in production. Exactly. So you know, yeah. if you if you were doing automation lower down, such as you know, uh, calling an API as opposed sure. to doing like a long distance, you know, user journey example. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could have if you had a public API, you could see in real time what your users are experiencing, uh, and, and like you said, you could work out a number, and the automation could learn from that number. Um, or it could just use it every time it ran. Yeah. Uh, and then you'd be getting, you know, real, um, uh, real useful data on your test, on your, you know, test environment or local machine, whatever you were using. Yeah. Um, and would give you a better insight instead of a lot of people do do this. As soon as things get released to live, performance might go up by a second and people don't notice. Yeah. Um, until it's gone up by a second five times and then suddenly, oh, five seconds. That's yeah. unacceptable. I think it, it also observing things like the sequence flow the you talked you mentioned you know what journey they're on or what flow through the through the application they're they're going after if you start observing some of that f analytic data aside from the performance stuff which is I love and it's totally interesting to me but the anal from the flow that you'll see you can check your your assumptions in your test design as to what those common flows are you may find that real users on a given release, change how they use the app in, in, on the whole and making the framework like a framework on top of a framework on top of a framework, which you mentioned before, which is then wrap, wrapped in a burrito and then <laughs> covered, covered in a pizza and put in a blueberry pancake. Um, you, could, you could actually have those analytic flows sort of inform the sequence and try different things. I think that when you re we get back to this thing of how to, what's the real value of doing automation, Two guys just having a chat across the Atlantic on Skype can come up with 15 other ideas of this would be valuable, this would be interesting, and we could yeah. get it to be a little more, bit more of a smarter framework, yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of the bit there is what, you know, is that it doesn't have to be, as you said, it doesn't have to be an end-to-end -end journey. We could utilize automation to serve any, per, any little step of what we've just discussed um, and actually get more value out of that tool. Yeah. Very cool. So, Richard, I mean, for somebody getting started, let's say they're a brand new tester and that's their first job. Uh, maybe they have some coding skills. You know, in, in, in school, they always teach you how to code, but they don't teach you how to test very well. Um, yeah. You know, if someone has an aptitude around coding, um, but they really don't like the developer lifestyle, I mean, do you invite them to try testing manually and automated? Or would you actually have people just jump in, learn WebDriver or learn a different tool and just jump into the automation game? Um, I think um, code itself, I think anyone can learn. Um, you know, you've, you've still got to have a desire to, you know, obviously want to use it. But I think the, the it's a good point. Like I got into testing because at uni, um, I, well, I, my placement year was testing, but I also did automation in my placement year as well as did some coding. Mm -hmm. But I never liked coding all the time. Right. Um, but I always I like testing what I, what it is I created. So I think testing does give people who like code but like testing that opportunity to do a bit of both still. Um, so I would definitely encourage anyone yeah. who likes doing some coding but not full time to you know delve into test automation. Um, you know, a lot of companies do have roles that just for that, um, you know, people like the software developer in test, um, you know, where their job is just to create tools yeah. for the test team. Um, or a lot of people do yeah. have, you know, as we, uh, we said, people's job is just to write automation. Um, but I think it is, you know, it's, it, there's so many skills to get from writing automation. I have a better understanding of the production code, how it hangs together, where I can find little ways in. Um, so I think it's it's a good idea, but I don't think everyone needs to do it. Yeah, yeah. So and I, I can still see people that drift towards product ownership or even technical product ownership, testers who are, are, don't really want to get into automation, but they really want to do critical thinking about real user behaviors, the experience, the flow, the business logic. I mean, there's there's plenty of place to go around, and they're still somewhat testers at heart, I think, in, in the end. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I think the um, the important thing there as well is that you know we, teams need those people. Not everyone needs to know, but the team needs to be able to deliver those tools. And also, businesses need to be aware that um, you know spending a day creating such tools is going to be beneficial to the business, even though it's not a day developing the actual product. Yeah, you know, these are going to help the rest of the. They are going to help the products in the long run, just, you know, not right now. Yeah, and be able to articulate that both quantitatively, if, if that's what you need, but, you know, obviously qualitatively, put, put the two together. In the performance world, we're always meshing qualitative and quantitative. It's always fun. Uh, you're very confusing. Yeah, absolutely. Bet. All right. So, um, so Richard, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of STP Radio. Um, no on behalf of the whole uh, community, th- we appreciate the time you spent with us today. Oh, I enjoyed it. Very good. And, of course, um, I will ask, you mentioned a couple of events like Less Test and stuff. Where might folks come and meet up with you or come to hear you present on these topics or other topics uh, in the near future? Um, so I'm going to be at CAST in New York in August. Okay. Um, talking there on the, the so-called benefits of automation. Cool. Um, and I will be talking about... Um, not automation, but exploratory testing, uh, um, agile testing days. Agile testing, it's also in August or is it later? Yeah, that's in November, I think, in Germany. Okay. And that's it for this year, I think. Very cool. It's already been a busy year. And then, of course, <laughs> hopefully we'll connect with you at Test Bash in the UK next year, yep. um, which I have to get. They, there are actually proposals are open. Uh, Call for Papers is open. It is open, yeah. Just, I think it's open till August. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Richard, I will also be at CAST in uh, New York City, so I'll see you there. See you there. Thanks, Richard. See you. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of STP Radio. As your host, it's my pleasure to bring these intriguing and engaging conversations to assist you in your quest to become a better software tester. Please be aware that this podcast is a production of the Software Test Professionals Organization and is copyrighted and protected via the Creative Commons Share with Attribution Non-Derivative Licensing. For more information, please visit www.softwaretestpro.com. And don't forget, this upcoming November is the STPCon Fall Conference in Denver, Colorado in the USA. Between now and then, there are multiple online training events coming up on performance testing, risk-based testing, testing automation, agile testing, and software test leadership. Visit www.softwaretestpro.com slash training to find out more. On behalf of myself and the entire STP community, please share this podcast with your fellow testers and developers and managers. Thanks for listening, and be sure to join us on the next episode of STP Radio.